You are listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church, located in Sandpoint, Idaho. We invite you to come and join us as we rightly divide the word of truth and encourage one another through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is our pastor and preacher, Eric Clerk. Let's open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 8. We are in chapter 8. We've looked at the silence in heaven. That was verse 1. Then we saw in verse 2 that seven angels got ready to blow on seven trumpets. And today we're going to do three verses, 3, 4, and 5. It's something interesting I was thinking about. You know, up to chapter, end of chapter 7, we had John up there in heaven describing things to us. And everything that he described to us had to do with the throne of God, where he that sat upon the throne. The glory goes to God. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, there was silence in heaven. And I told you that I believe that's because the throne of God had to do some business in the second heaven and also in the first heaven. And so God's throne departed for a little bit. And there was just quiet because nobody wanted to say anything. They all know what happened to the last guy who exalted himself up there. And it's interesting to me because suddenly John is taking notice of some of the other things up there. It's like his eyes were off the throne for a little bit. He had some time to look around and he's like, oh, there's a golden altar. And now he's going to mention it to me. I just find it very peculiar that that's the sequence of things. One of the things that I'll also do is we'll see later on how this a sequence here in things that really seem to murder and really match the Jewish holidays as they were throughout the year, the sequence of how things happen. So we see the golden altar here, and then we're going to see the trumpets getting blown, and there's a feast of trumpets. And when we look at Leviticus 23 later on, as at another time, you'll see that there is a, a real resemblance when you start at the Passover the, the lamb that was slain, and you work your way through, you can see how Revelation is following that same chronological order. It's very interesting. It's like, wow, yeah, it really does. And so we'll, we'll look at that also later on. But today we want to look at the golden altar. So let's do this. Let's read those verses together, and we'll talk a little bit. And I want us to read one verse at a time. Read for me, if you don't mind, read for me verse 3. Revelation 8, 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was the Lord of God. A couple of things that we are told here by the Holy Spirit. Number one, these angels are getting ready to blow their trumpets. And then there seems like to be a pause before they blow the trumpets. There's, there's going to be this offering up of the prayers of the saints. You see that? Let me, let me ask you, where's this golden altar? It's up in heaven. It says there it's before the throne. You see that? And then there's also, the angel has a golden what? Censer. He has a golden censer. That's like, a, for the kids, that's like a stick that has like a little cup at the end that he's going to do something with. He's got it, it, picture in your mind, like almost like a little shovel or spade, but it doesn't, it, it, it's a sense that it holds something. It can hold things in. It has like a cup at the end, like a long pot with a skinny pot at the end, right? Okay, so that is up in heaven. So before this, we were not told that there was any other furniture. We, we saw the throne of God. We saw the thrones that the 24 elders sat on and now... There's like, oh, there's also this golden altar. That's interesting. We're going to take a look at the golden altar today and what its purpose is and where it fits. It's very important. It's extremely important. Let's read verse 4 together. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now, notice it says out of the angel's hand, but we know that he's holding the censer, right? That was made clear in verse 3, but... They, they just make a, a mental note of that. We'll see that again sometime in the future. We'll, we'll take a look at Ezekiel 10, where the angel takes the coals in his hand and he, he blows it out, right? 
Okay, we, we saw that. The man of linen, he takes the... We, we've read that passage before. It's just interesting. And we see here that the smoke, the incense goes up as smoke before God. God is deceiving the prayers of the saints and it's, it's mixed with incense. You see that? It's, it's a sweet savor to him. It goes up, it, it, it smells good. It's incense. Okay, let's take a look here. Read for me verse 5. And the angel took the Now, we've seen that voices and thunderings and lightnings before, right? When we saw that it came from the throne of God back in Revelation 4, 5. You recall that? And so that's an interesting thing, those three things. And now we see that there's also, there's an earthquake. So he takes the coals and he throws it to the earth and something happens. And we're going to see next week that they're going to blow the trumpets. And every time a trumpet blows, something's going to happen. And we'll take a look at that. But I want to I wanna see, so, so Friday night was the parade of the lost in the 50s here in Sandpoint. And it was, it was fun. You know, even for a person who's blind, you know, I'm standing on the corner there and I've got all the cars going past me and they, they pretty much, you know, are all the same, you know, going by. Right? I can't tell that one is a 60 this and a, that one's a 50 that and that one's a 40 that, Chevy, Ford, whatever, you know, Plymouth, I don't know. I just hear them, but I, I must say, I really like those ones that when they're idle, they kind of, sounds like they're going to stutter and die every, any second. Like, bloop, 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 bloop. Yeah. That's my favorite. I love it. And then the guy hits the gas and he goes, rrr, 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 you know. Yeah, and then there was some guy in a cyber truck or something that came by and went by. And I was like, you know. And I mean, that, it's just, it's not the same. I mean, I don't know what he was doing there, but, you know, probably wanted to just show off his new truck, you know. But anyways, but it was a fun, it was a fun for that. It was really fun just standing there, listening to all the cars. And there was a, a young mom who stood next to me and she had a, a little girl. The girl was about, I would guess, about maybe three years of age. And this little kid was restless and the mommy was telling the girl, she kept, kept saying, lovey, 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 look at the cars, look at the cars. And the kid was not interested in the cars. In fact, I can just see how they had to leave the playground to come to the parade just in time to see, watch the cars. And the kid just wants to, to do other things. And, and she was getting a little, you know, frustrated because she wants to go do stuff. She wants to go down and play. And now there's all these cars and telling, telling her to watch the cars would be like, somebody taking you and sticking you outside Walmart and say, watch the cars, look at the cars. Now, some of you might enjoy it, but that little kid was not happy, right? There's nothing special for her about that cause. And I got thinking about that. You know, there was definitely people there, some of you included, who loves cars and who knows the different cars and they're excited and they'll point out to their children and say, you know, look at that one. That's a 45, 45 this and a 47 that and a 52 this and Look at that guy and, you know, the guys who love cars, they love a parade like this where they see different cars, right? And I, was, I started thinking about it, how we, we see the things that we love and we, we take special interest in that. And as Bible believers, we read a passage like this in Scripture about the golden altar up there in heaven. And it, and it stirs us up, it gets us excited. Years ago, when I was going to a church, and I was saved for 30-some years, and we were going to a church in the valley, I had no idea, no idea, that there was a temple in heaven. I did, it was foreign to me. I didn't even know that. That's so basic that there's a temple in heaven, yet I didn't know that. And it's amazing to me how we as people, we see things through our own lens and through our own perspective. You know, that little kid, she probably saw the other kids in the crowd, but she didn't care about the, the cause. And, and it sort of reminded me too of the Lord Jesus when he went to the temple. And he's looking around and there's this hustle and bustle and his disciples are all excited about the beauty, the splendor of the temple. And we find out, if you compare the three synoptic gospels, you'll see that it was Judas Iscariot who was really leading that charge of, of just going on about how beautiful the temple is and everything and all the glamour and this and that. And it's sad when you consider for a moment that there's a temple in heaven 
and he's standing right beside the one who's going to sit on the throne up there in heaven on the right hand of God. And he is so fascinated with the temple on earth and then he betrays the Lord Jesus and he goes to hell and he never gets to go up there. One of the other disciples, John, gets taken up there and he comes back and the Holy Spirit allows him to describe to us what he sees. And he does describe it to us in, in the detail, but yet our imaginations, we can't even begin to famine it. Paul was not allowed to tell us what he saw. He just said, the eyes have not seen nor the ears heard. He says it's just mind-blowing, essentially. That's plain English. It's just wild. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's beyond your wildest dreams. But yet, the Lord Jesus is in the temple while the disciples are going on about how beautiful everything is. And he looks around. You know what he sees? He sees the most faithful person in that temple. He sees a widow taking her two pennies and putting it in. And I was thinking about Laodicean Christians, how we can find any excuse today why we can't go to church, you know. Well, I can't go there. I don't have enough money for gas. You know, it's too expensive. You know, why drive all the way to Sandpoint just for an hour? You know, it's just too much. And then there you have a widow in the temple, taking the last two pennies that she has and putting it in. God is not impressed by the bells and whistles and the people blowing their trumpets and Pharisee so-and-so is about to cast in his mini fortune. ka clink ka clink ka clink ka clink ka clink You know, they made a big scene every time they put money in. God doesn't, doesn't care about that. He doesn't care about how much money you throw into the offering plate as much as he cares about the fact that you come consistently and faithful. You know, he takes notice of faithfulness. That's what he takes notice of. He really cares about the fact that that widow made the effort to be there on that day. That's what he takes notice of. And and that whole big crowd of people, people dressed all to the hills and everything, and all these important people, God points out, look at that widow. (laughs) She put in two pens into into that box. Faithfulness, that's what God takes note of. So... As Bible believers, let's take a look at this golden altar and the golden censer. And let's take a look and see what we can learn from it. Because obviously it has to be important because it's mentioned to us that everything, all the proceedings is put on halt until they've burned the incense and lifted up the prayers. And we know that a lot of these prayers are from those that we saw the saints in Revelation chapter 6 who were slain for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the word of God. And that how much longer must we wait? Remember, they were crying to God. And now these prayers are offered up to God. And God hears their prayers. And then as a result of that, He's going to act upon it. And He's going to pour out judgment. But what I want to look at is three things today. I want to look at three P's as far as the, as the golden altar go. I want to look at the pattern. The pattern in heaven. The second thing I want to look at is the placement of the golden altar. And then the third thing I want to look at is the purpose of the golden altar. And I've got to do it all within the short amount of time that we have. So let's take a look at that. First thing I want to just point out to you as we look at the pattern. We've looked at some of these verses before. But just flip back to chapter 7. I want to just prove to you that there is a temple in heaven. There's many, many verses to prove that. I'm just going to show you two. And we're going to move on. But look at chapter 7. Read for me verse 15 about these saints who will serve God in His temple. And take note that they are before his throne. The temple is in heaven. Read 7.15 for me, please. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall follow among them. So we see that they are before the throne. God will dwell among them, and that they will serve him day and night in his temple. This temple is in heaven. Go over to chapter 11. Just flip over to chapter 11. Now I'm just going to show you a verse that doctrinally fits into eternity, but I just want to show you this. Read for me verse 19, the last verse there. So we see all those things, the voices, the lightnings, the thunders, but you notice there that the word temple is 
twice, it appears twice in that verse. You see that? And that this temple is where? In, in, heaven. in heaven. So there you have it, black and white. There's a temple up in heaven. I was saved for 30 some years and I didn't know that there was a temple in heaven. And that the temple on earth was fashioned and patterned after the temple that was up in heaven. Go to Acts chapter 7. I just want to show you that Stephen is preaching to the Sanhedrin, the great council. And he's going to talk about this, how this temple that was the tabernacle that Moses had built was fashioned after the temple that was up in heaven. We want to look at this because when we look at the placement of this golden altar, it's going to be very interesting. You're going to see something absolutely fascinating about where it fits and where it should fit in your spiritual walk with the Lord. It's absolutely amazing. Read for me verse 44, 744. Acts 7, 44. Yeah, Acts chapter 7, verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. So Moses had seen the fashion, and he fashioned it accordingly. You see that? Just real quick, read for me 48 and 49. Take a look at this fact that God's throne is in heaven and the earth is His footstool. Take a look here. How be it the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will He build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Okay, now let's take a look here. Go to Hebrews chapter 8. We just want to look a little bit about this pattern. In looking at the pattern, we're going to see something really amazing about the golden censer and the golden altar. Hebrews chapter 8. Let's read verse 1 and 2. Now, take note of this thing is loaded, okay? Number one, who's our high priest? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? Notice there it calls him the minister of the sanctuary. Do you see that? Sanctuary. Sanctuary, think of the word sanctification. Sanctuary. Sanctification has to do with holiness, right? The sanctuary is, the, is called the, the holy place. There's also, if you go into the temple, there was the holy, holy place, and then there was the holy of holies. And the priest, they used to minister in the sanctuary. We're going to see that. That's where they would burn the incense every morning and every evening. And we see here that we have a high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is ministering for us in the sanctuary. Do you see that? And it's also talking about the true tabernacle. It, it, it's not talking about the temple that's in Jerusalem. It's talking about the one that's up in heaven. Take a look here. Read for me verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to so you see there the word pattern. God showed him the pattern of the heavenly temple and he made everything accordingly, according to this pattern. Now, without going to Exodus, and we're going to do that just now, we're going to look at what this altar looks like. We as humans, we think of this altar and you start thinking about something like you would see in Las Vegas and Caesar's Palace, some elaborate big altar, you know, with waterfalls and all these statues and all this stuff. And what I want you to see as we go through it is that God, His altar 
And Moses is fashioning it according to his altar. You know what the size is of that altar? It's about the size of the old lectern that we had in here. It's one cubit by one cubit by two cubits tall. That's about 36 inches tall, give or take, by, and the top of it is 18 by 18 inches. It, and it's made out of pure gold. And it's beautiful. But it's not there to get the glory. The glory, it belongs to God. It's a piece of furniture. It's really interesting when you begin to look at the throne room of the Almighty God and you see how few pieces of furniture is in there. You know, it's really amazing. But let's take a look here. Go over to chapter 9 for me, if you don't mind. Go to chapter 9, the next chapter over. Just go to see a couple of things. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And read for me there, read for me verse 2. So here we see the sanctuary is containing the table with the shoe bread and also the candlestick. And I will show you from Scripture just now that the golden altar was also in that room, in the sanctuary. So there's the candlestick that's on top of the table and then you have the shoe bread. Remember the shoe bread was in two rows of six. It was six and then six. And I told you before that that bread is a type of the Word of God and the Word of God. Word of God, lowercase w, and also Word of God, uppercase w. The Lord Jesus Christ is the bread of life, but we also know that the Word of God, the Bible, Scripture, is the bread of life too for us. It's what God uses. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed of out of the mouth of God, right? Told you that is one of the things you need to memorize and you can reflect on whenever you are tempted spiritually and so, or physically too. So what you, what you see here is in that same room in the sanctuary, there's also going to be the golden altar. I'm going to show it to you just now. But now take a note here. Read for me verse 3. And after a second veil, So now it's going to describe to us the Holy of Holies. And let's see what we find in there. Take a look here. And this is where you're going to find golden censer. Take a look here. Verse 4. Which has a golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein is the golden censer and the ark of the covenant. And Aaron's rod that budded at the tables of the covenant. And you see what's interesting if you were searching for the word golden for golden altar that you saw in Revelation 8, you would land on, on, on this verses here because it talks about the golden censer. Do you see that? Now, what's so interesting is this. Where's this golden censer described as being? It's described as being in the Holy of Holies. Do you see that? That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's not the sanctuary. That's the Holy of Holies. And then, So if you went into the temple, I'm just going to tell you a little quick. If you went up to the temple, you will see outside a brazen altar. The blazing altar was made out of glass. And that's where they burned the sacrifice. And then you would go into the temple. So the first thing you saw as a person walked up to the temple, by the way, is you would see fire. You would be reminded of hell. And that there has to be a sacrifice made on the blazing altar. And then when you go inside, you go into the sanctuary. And the sanctuary had the table with the shoe bread with the candlestick, and then it also had the golden altar, the altar of incense. And that was right by the veil. There was a veil on the other side of the altar, right by it. And on the other side of that veil was the Ark of the Covenant. That's, that's what it looked like. And now what's very interesting, as you look at verse 4, it tells us that the golden censer was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And what's so interesting about it is these new Bibles, the, the people who translate them, they can't figure that out. It's, it's just too difficult for them. And so they make this argument. You can read some of their notes that they wrote. So they translate the Greek word that means censor, they translate it as altar. And so what they do is they put the golden altar. You can read an ESV, you can read an NIV, 
the New Living Translation, the New American Standard Bible, and what you will see is they put the golden altar, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, they put the golden altar inside the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant. That's where they put it. And that opens up a problem because you will see, for example, in Luke 1, you will see that Zacharias, whose wife was Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, he, the lot fell on him and he was ministering as it pleased, burning the incense in the sanctuary may, when, at the time of prayers. He didn't go into the Holy of Holies. He was inside the sanctuary. So he's... In the sanctuary, not in the Holy of Holies, but yet these new Bibles will put it in the Holy of Holies. And the reason is, is because this flows in for a loop, this idea that the golden censer would go into the Holy of Holies. And yet, it's so simple. And you know what their argument is for, for changing it from golden censer to golden altar? You wouldn't believe this. Because they say they can't find the golden censer in the Old Testament. That's their argument. They, because they can't find it, therefore it mustn't, must not exist. That's nearly a, it's a, it's a simple argument. But I'm going to show you something just now. I'll show you the golden, the sense that it is found in the Old Testament. In fact, I can give you three places for memory where it's found. And it's funny to me that these guys didn't see that. But before we depart here, I just want to show you. So just put that on the back burner. I'm going to prove to you that this, this golden altar is in the sanctuary and it's not in the Holy of Holies. But... Why did the golden censer go in the Holy of Holies? Simple. Because one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest himself will take that golden censer and he'll take the incense and the, and the coals, and it's described for us in the book of Exodus, and he would then go proceed and go into the Holy of Holies with the golden censer. It was something that when the golden censer, and I want you to get this in your mind, the golden censer takes you from the sanctuary into the Holy of Holies in the hand of the high priest. And he would then burn incense in there. And he would burn a lot of incense inside that Holy of Holies. In fact, he would burn so much incense in there first before he would enter in. So it's as though he would take the censer and he would stick it through the veil, the curtain, and let it burn in there before he went in himself. It was a scary thing to go in there. Yeah, they would put a chain around, you know, bells on his, 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 his garment so that they could hear him moving around in there with a chain that if he, if he stopped, they could just pull him out. Nobody wanted to go in there and bring him out. It, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So anyways, so the golden censer would go into the Holy of Holies, and that's why it's described here in Hebrews that if you were, in the, if you were seeing it from God's perspective, remember the Holy Ghost is lighting this, inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant and the golden censer. It was one of the few things that would come in there. So just bear that in mind. That's why it says golden censer. The word in Greek is definitely censer. In fact, it's so perverted in the New Bibles that even the Strong's Concordance, I looked it up. If you looked up that word, it will, it will now say, well, it, it could also mean a golden altar. That's because he sat on the Device Version Committee and he changed it to golden altar. But that word in Greek really just means censor. It doesn't mean altar. But they will change it. Men will change it to fit their doctrine. But in, in doing so, they actually create a contradiction in Scripture because you're going to see just now it's not there. Okay, read for me verse 6 and 7. Just... I want to quickly show you that the priest would minister in the sanctuary, verse 6, and that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, verse 7. Take a look at it. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the doers of the people. So really, if they had just compared Scripture to Scripture, they would have seen that, right? Read for me 8 and 9. The Holy Ghost is this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while that the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. As pertaining to the conscience. Okay, so the Holy Ghost had not yet shown them what the way in was. The way in is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the, 
the truth, the way, and the life, right? That's him. He's the way in. That's how you get into the Holy of Holies. He's our high priest. And so all of these things were figures of things to come. Take a look here. Read for me verse 11 and 12. So it's his blood, right? Drop down the 23 for me, verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified by these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the, the temple on earth was purified with the blood of bulls and goats, but the temple in heaven was purified with something better than that. What was that? The blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? No wonder the devil hates the blood of Jesus Christ so much. In the New Bibles, Colossians 1.14, the devil takes out redemption through his blood. You know that? Yeah, there's power in the blood. We sing that song and, and the devil hates that. Yeah, and t- take a look at how the pattern, it talks about the pattern, right? Read for me verse 24. Take a look at it. It says true. Take a look here. Read verse 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So the true temple is the one that's up in heaven. Do you see that? The temples on earth is just a figure of the true. you see that? Okay, let me show you real quick. Uh, just a place where you could find that censor. Go to Second Chronicles chapter 26. King Uzziah. He started off good, ended up being a leper. Second Chronicles chapter 26. Just want to see the importance of this. Uzziah did not go into the Holy of Holies. Yet you'll see him there. He goes into the sanctuary. And that's where he has the sense that he should not be doing this. It's not his job to do this. Go down. Read for me. Read for me verse 16 and 17, please. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And as a riot of priests went in after him, and with them four sore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. Now read for me the next two verses. Take a look here. 18 and 19. And they would stood beside the king and said unto him, It hath pertaineth not unto thee, Messiah, to burn incense unto the Lord. But to the priests, the son of Mary, that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Messiah was wroth, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And if you keep reading, he dies with leprosy on him. He lives his whole life. Why? He took the censer. Did you see that there in verse 20? He has a censer in his hand. That's the censer. He picked up that censer on the golden altar. And he got leprosy from doing that. There's something about this golden altar. God doesn't want the wrong people to mess with it. Do you see that? This guy was the king, and he was lifted up. He went and touched that thing, and it, he got leprosy from it. And the priest even told him he shouldn't be doing that. Go to Exodus chapter 30. Let's take a look at this pattern a little bit more. It's fascinating. We'll spend most of our time looking at this pattern, but it's, it's just so interesting. There is absolute necessity for this golden altar. And yet, we as Christians... 
We often overlook that. We think of the shub there. We think of the candlestick. The candlestick represents the Holy Ghost. The shub there represents the Word of God. So obviously the golden altar should represent something that is of vital importance to the Christian. And you know what it is? It's prayer. That's what it represents. It represents prayer. It represents the gospel. The, it, 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 it brings it all together. The golden censer in the hand of the high priest, that's the Lord Jesus Christ lifting up our prayers. That's what it represents. And he takes it for us into the Holy of Holies. Take a look here. Here's the pattern given to Moses. Exodus chapter 30. Read for me the first four verses. Actually, let's read the first three verses. Just take a look. Here. You'll see the one by one cubit by two cubits. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of shit and wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof. And and you know what's interesting to me as I look at that dimensions one by one by two, and I can't help but think about when we talked about the ordinances. Remember, I told you that there were two ordinances, and each ordinance comprised of two parts. There was the we we always say the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is the gospel, but there is the death. There's the suffering. And his death. That's in the ordinance of when we take the Lord's Supper. Because the, the bread is his body that was broken for us. And the, the, the grape juice that we drink is the blood that was poured out for us. Right? So there's two parts to that. And then the resurrection, which is reflected in baptism, is the, the burial and the resurrection. And that also comprises of two parts. And do you see it? There's one by one by two. You see those, the one that is two parts, the, the burial and there's an action, but you also see the one and one, the sufferings, and you see his death. It's, it's just right there. It's a, it's a picture of the gospel, just in the dimensions, with the crown on top of it and the two horns. It's absolutely fascinating. Okay, you guys read to verse 3. Read for me verse 4 and verse 5. Take a look here. So everything about this altar, the altar itself is overlaid with gold. The, the things are made out of gold. The, the staves that's going to come in, that they, they're not going to touch this altar. They're going to push these, just like the, the Ark of the Covenant, they're going, to have, they're going to push the staves through those things, and then they're going to pick it up by the staves, but they ain't touching that, that altar. Do you see that? And even those staves are made out of gold. Everything that touches that altar is made out of gold. You see that? Now we, we know that there's, there was a censer. The Uzziah had the censer there. So why would we not know that the censer, that, which is going to touch the altar, is going to be made out of gold also? We see that in Revelation, that it's made the pattern in heaven. It's a, it specifically said it's a golden censer, that's a golden altar. It's, it's, it's plain and simple. How could the translators say that we can't say golden censer in Hebrews 9? The Greek didn't make sense to them, so they had to translate it as golden altar. Because they say we can't find golden censer anywhere in the Old Testament. When they can find censer, and they can find everything else is made out of gold. That touches that thing. Why would it not be made out of gold? It's just, it's, it's mind-blowing. Okay, now I want to show you the placement. Where did this thing stand? Okay, so we're going to move on to the second P. And we're also going to look at the, the, the purpose of it, okay? And that's, we're going to find there. Read for me verse 6. Take a look here. Verse 6. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. Now, it says before, before the ark, right? And it's before the veil. So at this point, you might say, well, 
Could it be inside the Holy of Holies? Or is it outside the Holy of Holies? You're not 100% sure, right? Okay, just hold your finger here because we're coming right back. We're almost done, but I just want you to see something. Go to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. And drop down for me to verse 26 and 27. You'll see there, it talks about how Moses is... Is oh sorry, well Eden is doing everything and they, 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 they bring in the Ark of the Covenant and then he goes in and he puts up the table of shoe bed and he puts up the candlestick and he lights the candles. Everything is done in a precise order. And then he brings in the altar, the golden altar, and then he lights the incense on it. Take a look at it for me, 26 and 27. And he put the golden And if you were to read, when you have time, the other verses before that, you will see that that is in the same room as where the shoe bread was in the candlestick. So the Holy Spirit makes it very clear for us where it's standing. So where's the placement? The placement is inside the sanctuary. So let's go back to, to chapter 30. Let's, we were at verse 6. I want you to ponder something here. We have inside there, we have the shoe bread, that's the Word of God. We have the candlestick, that's the Holy Spirit. And then we have the altar of incense, which, which is associated with prayer. We saw it in Revelation 8. We saw it also, you'll see it in Luke chapter 1, if you were to read there, that the priest would offer the incense during the time of the prayer. That's, when, that's, what it is, that's where it was used. So the placement of it is in the sanctuary. So the place, where does it belong? It belongs in the sanctuary. So when you come into the sanctuary, you have the Holy Spirit guiding you through the Word of God, and it convicts you, and it brings you to the golden altar, which is the place where you, that's your prayer. So after you get convicted by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, what are you supposed to do? You are supposed to lift up your prayers to God. That's what it's indicating us. There's three vital things in that, in that sanctuary. The Word of God, the Holy Ghost, and prayer. And think about this. If you are the enemy, and you're trying to disrupt service between God and his children, there's two-way communication going on between God and his children. God speaks to his children through his word, and the children speaks back to God through prayer. So what you're going to do is you're going to disrupt the word of God by bringing out all these false translations, and they're going to corrupt the word of God, and so that's where you, the way you can disrupt the communication from God down to his children. And then you're going to disrupt the prayer life of the people and you're going to get them to think that, you know, you pray before you eat your meal and maybe, maybe before you go to bed you say your prayers. No, the Bible tells us as, as Christians in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, pray without ceasing. Men are always to pray. We are to pray continually. You and I are constantly to be in a, in, in a mindset of prayer. You have to reflect on Scripture. You have to sing songs in your heart, and you have to pray. It's good to have a good prayer life. You'll find that the people who are the best soul winners are also men who and women who have the most effective prayers. They, they pray. They spend a lot of time on their knees. All these great names in the past, the people who really went out and won a lot of souls and the evangelists, they spend a lot of time on their knees before God. You need to purify yourself as part of sanctification. That's the purpose of this golden altar. And the Lord Jesus Christ is our mediator. He's, he's our high priest and he takes our prayers from the golden altar, from the sanctuary. We can't go. You and I don't go into the Holy of Holies. But the Lord Jesus Christ takes it and he takes that sensor in for us into the Holy of Holies and presents it before God. That's what he does. That's, that's why it's so important that when you play, you play in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't play in the name of Mary or anybody else. You see in 1 Kings 18, you see in verse 26, you'll see that they cry, Oh, oh Baal, hear us. You know, Baal is not hearing them. It's playing, playing to Mary is, is playing to Baal. Same black robe priest doing the same thing. Okay, let's take a look at the purpose. What is the purpose? We talked about it. It's to lift up our face. But I want you to see something more as, as we can see right in the passage. Read for me verse 7. So every morning is when 
Aaron is burning incense, okay? Now take a look at this. In other words, what we see here is there's a specific time set aside to come in and burn this incense. Now take a look here, verse 8. Read for me verse 8. And so the Jews would go up to the temple and they would go, there was in the morning and then there was in the evening. They had prayers. And it just amazes me. We were traveling one time. We were in a our family in a car in South Africa. It was me and my, my mom and dad and my siblings. And we, we came to a rest stop and it was six o'clock in the morning and we got out of the car. It was kind of chilly and we were just having a little bit of food on the side of the road. And another family pulled in with their, their, their microbus and they all piled out of there and they lay down this carpet on the ground and they all got down facing east and they were a bunch of Muslims and they were playing. And it just, it's convicting to think about the fact that people who are, plays, are playing to a false god is more, is, is, it, it, they are more committed to making time to play every single morning. And my question to you is, how's your prayer life? Do you make time? We, we make time to read our Bibles, but do you also set aside time in the morning to pray to God? Set aside time in the evening to go down, maybe go into your closet or someplace where it's just you and God and you get on your knees and you pray to God? We, we see from the example of Daniel that Daniel used to do that three times a day. Daniel would go and he'd, he'd open up the windows and he would pray to God. He was committed. And, and, you know, God can use somebody who is faithful. That's what you see, a faithfulness. God no, takes note of faithfulness. You know, he really takes note of the person who makes the time every single day to get on his knees and play for, to him. The person to whom it is important enough that they set time aside. Isn't that interesting? Take a look here at verse 9. Read for me verse 9. See, God doesn't want your prayers to have any strange incense in them. He doesn't want it, to be, want it to be contaminated. He doesn't want you to be on your knees with little beads and stuff doing the Catholic thing. Okay? He doesn't want you to contaminate it and be playing to dead saints or, or to Mary. He, does, he wants you to be playing to the Lord Jesus Christ. You, it's the high priest who takes your prayers in. To God the Father. You play to the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's how you play. And that's, and that's also one of the reasons you want to make sure that the, the priest had to cleanse himself before he went in there and he did the service. There was a whole procedure he wants to go through. And one of the things that you need to consider is when you get on your knees and you play to God is, is first take care of your own sins before you start laying out all your petitions before God. First take care of yourself. Play for yourself. Ask God to forgive you your sins and show you the things and your transgressions and the iniquities that's in your heart, right? Okay, let's read verse 10. Take a look here. And I want you to see here that this is most holy unto the Lord. There's only a few things in Scripture that is called most holy. Prayer is an essential part. The golden altar reminds us of the importance of prayer, and it is most holy. Prayer is up there with reading your Bible. Prayer is up there with, with having the Holy Spirit guide you as you're reading your Bible. The Holy Spirit also guides you in your prayer life. But you have to make time, just as you need to make time to read your Bible, you may need to make time for prayer. Prayer is so important. Challenge yourself this week. See if you can set aside some time every single day to get on your knees before God and, and, and make prayer essential. And, and remember, you don't want to be burning strange incense on it. If you, if you were to look at Leviticus 10, you will see there that the sons of Aaron offered strange fire unto the Lord. And they put strange fire in their censers. By the way, that's another place where you will find the word censer. And, and 
you will see that the Lord came down and with, with lightning and fired and burned them and killed them. God doesn't want you to contaminate yourself with, with false worship, with false idols, with strange fire. He wants you to be, your, your players to be pure. Now, I'm not saying this to discourage you from playing. You need to play. But make sure you purify your heart. How do we purify our hearts? We saw it last week. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Right? You purify yourself with the word of God. So as you come into the sanctuary, you have the shub there. That's the word of God. The Holy Spirit guides you. That purifies your heart. And then you go to the altar of incense and you make your prayers to God. That's how, it, that's how it works. It's an essential part. And God takes it so serious that when the trumpets are about to blow, they say, stop. First need to make prayer. When they hear the prayers of the saints first. It's important to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much that we can study your word, that we can see that prayer is such an important and integral part of our worship to you. And we ask you, Father, to help us this week as we all take charge of our own lives and our own player lives and we all consider how we can become better at playing to you and spending time with you and meeting with you, Lord. We thank you now and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church. Please visit us at www.shepherdsgrace.org for more information.